to the Big Book Workshop. This is not your traditional meeting nor your traditional Big Book study. Uh, we get into the meat and potatoes of the Big Book and we look at the highlights and discuss it in detail. Um, for the purpose of this Zoom meeting, the meeting will be muted if, with the exception of our facilitators, myself, Kimberly, uh, Joe to my right on my screen and Tony to my left on my screen. Um, and uh, we only have a couple rules around here. Uh, number one is if you have your video on, your clothes must be on. Um, if your clothes aren't on, your video can't be on. And uh, any inappropriate behavior will result in you being removed imme immediately. So that includes in the chat um, as well as on screen. Um, we try to keep the chat open so that you can ask questions or answer questions. Um, but if it's uh, becoming a problem, we will have to turn it off. We have a couple of co-hosts assigned to help us monitor behavior. So please keep your clothes on and your behavior above board. And uh, I was going to ask Joe to say the set aside prayer, but Joe disappeared. Oh, there he is. There he is. I'm here. The dogs are just going nuts. They want me to open the door. Um, my name is Joe, recovered alcoholic. Hey, Joe. And how we start this thing uh, is uh, with the set aside prayer. And, and the reason why is in looking at some of the stuff, we're going to be looking at it from a new perspective, a new view. This prayer helps you get into that state. Uh, and, and really soak it in too. Dear God, please set aside everything I think I know about myself, this book, my illness, these steps, and especially about you, dear God, so that I might have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please help me to see the truth. Thanks. We're right on. Recovered alcoholic. My name's Tony. Sobriety dates April 8, 1989. Pretty exciting night. Um, we're going to probably look at a lot of things that some of you probably looked at it that way, but some of you probably going to hear stuff in, in uh, probably in a, in a new format. We're just going to use the book, and we're going to go with what the book says, but we're going to back up, and uh, we're going to start on page 45. I don't know if anybody would have guessed that page, but we're going to start there and, and get do some highlights to where we are and the underlying theme what this is all about. Because a lot of people talk about different layers to this thing, but there really is only one purpose, one theme to this thing, right? But a lot of people miss it because they they start going into, remember what our first obsession is. Anybody remember what our first obsession is on page 23? Ourselves and being our own solution. Anybody ever have a problem with that idea? All of us had a problem with that. It gets very painful pursuing our own ideas to what we think is the solution to ourselves. Right, And then, veritably, a lot of us end up getting drunk again, very depressed, suicidal, hospitalized, jail institutions. You know, you don't have to be drinking to end up in a puzzle, in a puzzle factory, right? Some of us take a long time to try to get our cheese back on the same plate as a cracker, right? And that's the whole idea here, right? Some of us, our cheese and our cracker haven't been on the same plate for years. So hopefully by the time you, you get to this stage of the game in step 11, at least they're all in, in the same proximity on the same plate and you get to kind of organize them a bit. So we kind of, we discovered, we, we know the symptoms of alcoholism. We understand there's two symptoms in alcoholism. We understand that alcoholism is beyond our pay grade. We kind of talked about that on page 44. We understand in the preceding chapters is so we learned something about alcoholism. We were able to diagnose ourselves now with what type of alcoholic we are and this, the necessary solution and whether we need spiritual aid or not to, um, to overcome this thing. And if we want to overcome this thing, some people want to go on to the bitter end. I know people who've made a decision that, you know what, I don't want this solution. I just want to carry on and live my life the way I'm living. I mean, my dad a lot of years before, but they're ha quite happy doing what they're doing. As an observer, it doesn't make sense to me, but I'm sure there was a time my story didn't make sense to a lot of people either, right, <laughs> what you're doing. So being convinced, you know, that, that any life run on self-willed, and they talked about here, um, the inability to create this change with inside of myself based on, on a singular act. So we hear a lot of people talk about acceptance. We hear a lot of people talk about letting go, turning it over, surrender. These, these singular acts sound nice, but it doesn't bring about the necessary power, that relationship we need in order to create this change. And they talked about that on page 44, 45. If a mere code of morals or better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago. True or false? 
right? How many people really tried to change their lives? How many people tried to be better people? How many tried, tried to be kind? Work on my behaviors, work on this, go to church, be Mr. Bean in the choir, like on and on, right? Like we, we tried all these great things, but inside the argument never changed, right? That that kind of, that dilemma of self. So they talk about here, what's that in uh, page 45 there? What's our problem? What do you got, Kim? Lack of power. That was our dilemma. What's a dilemma? A problem. Yeah. So now we understand what that dilemma is in association with, right? If you would have went just to this page, you wouldn't understand what that dilemma was in association with. And it's very specific about the kind of change we need to obtain in order to recover from this thing, right? So they're saying the only thing that, that started this conversation way back when the book started was the story of how many um, men, thousands of men and women had recovered from alcoholism. And then when they started this, they said, you know, um, we have Alcoholics Anonymous or more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. And then they do the introduction in a doctor's opinion. And the doctor said people who were afflicted with his illness, they seemed in, in his, his, his kind of... Um, uh, in his uh, treatment center and his observations, there only seems to be one thing that was sufficient enough to help these certain types of alcoholics. And what was that? Entire psychic change. Entire psychic change, right? And otherwise, what keeps on happening, the promise of step one, they keep on relapsing over and over and over again, even though they don't want to. So it becomes an act against their own will, regardless. And then when we went through Bill's story, we hear all this nice stuff. It sounds nice and fluffy from the podium. You know, I was given the gift of desperation. I've been, well, if you really want to break that down, that's the gift of my connection with God. G-O-D, gift of desperation. I got that from Joe. Right? The gift of desperation is need to reach out to something greater than you and pursue a remedy. Because if the gift of desperation was enough, would a bill got of sober the second time in treatment? If it was enough, yeah, he would have. If, if the gift of desperation, acceptance and surrender and willing to go to any lengths. Remember in Bill's story the second time around? He had all the elements that we hear in the fellowship of somebody should be able to get their life together. And so was that enough for Bill to create this transformation with inside of himself to recreate his life? Did he have the willingness to recreate his life? 100%. Did he have the desire? Would he, was he willing to do anything it took? Did he have the gift of desperation? What he wouldn't give, eh? Right? And then he kind of submitted to the fact that the ultimate surrender. Alcohol was my master. So he should be good to go. And then we find out, based on his conversation with the doctor previous to that, he said, you know, fear kept him sober for a while, right? But then what happened was the insidious insanity returned. Not the obsession, the insanity. He couldn't see, feel, and he was back drinking again, right? Remember, somebody pushed a drink his way one of those times. He took it. Was I crazy? The thinking after the drink. Not before the drink. If we were able to kind of logically look at a drink beforehand, then it wouldn't be an illness. It would be a behavioral problem. How many people here is after they've taken a drink, go, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm not supposed to be drinking. How many people made a solemn oath here never to drink again? How many people, how many, like over and over and over, right? And then you come to A looking for a solution to a dilemma that, that's beyond your scope of understanding that dilemma. What is this problem that I have? So, here a lot of people say, I've done step one before I got here. Unless somebody explained to you alcoholism, what you did was suffer from step one before you got here. Here you learn the fatal nature of your illness and you get to concur whether you have it or not. So, by the time you get to page 44, you concur that I have this, this twofold illness. And left to my own devices, I'm going to drink again. And the only thing that's going to save me is a psychic change of spiritual experience. I have a problem with that. They said, we know you have a problem with us. So let us explain to you what we mean by a power greater than ourselves. Let's give you our understanding of this power. So collectively, you'll understand what we mean. And step 3 and 11 says, made a decision to turn our will and life over the care of God as we understood him. How did they understood him? Collectively, they have the same understanding. Remember when they started this thing, right? They agree on the problem, the solution, and the course of action. Do they not? 
right? And then when they got into there is a solution in the fourth fourth edition that said since thousands. And when they started this edition here, they said the story of how many thousands of men and women have recovered. So it concurs. It's the same story. We all have the same story. It may have different highlights. Some of us may have a little more to work on than others, but it's the same story. It's the same dilemma. And in the solution, in the spiritual appendix in the back of the book, they say all our members, with few exceptions, have tapped into what? An inner resource of strength. Right? So we all have the same outcome. As the result of these steps, we experience a psychic change of spiritual experience. It's not a singular event. If you want what we have. So we need to all learn the same language. I don't know if that, does that kind of make sense? It's like apprenticeship. What we have here is a spiritual apprenticeship that we all learn the same language. So somebody new coming in, I teach them what was taught to me through our manual. This will be our manual on how to achieve my doctrine in spiritual development. I don't know how else to say that, like a mechanics course or a doctor or a librarian, like, uh, I mean, a cook. They all have certain books that they follow recipes in. Do they not? Yeah. Did you want to add something to that, Joe? I just wanted to. If anybody ever had a problem with that, kind of the collective understanding, it, it, the preface really hammers it out. You can always take an individual back to that, and it says, because this book has become the basic text for what? Our society. They're talking about the first hundred men and women who collectively put it together using this solution. Common peril, common solution, their way out, right? So there's really, you got to understand when you're joining a society, this is kind of like uh, the Constitution and Bylaws. You gotta understand what they're talking about. Then you can be really, you know, you know, you can have the desire to stop drinking and show up and just visit. Or do you really want to be a part of this thing? This is where you're gonna find that, and that's what they're talking about there. We collectively have a way out, right? We all understand it. Maybe we all experience it a little differently, but we all know what we're talking about when explaining it. So, and and you hear people say, oh, well, that's your own understanding. Well, no, not the first three steps. It's not your understanding. Right of what they mean and the conclusion of you could have your own conception of what it means, but you need to understand what we mean by that. So when they say we, they're talking collectively, and a lot of people will go, "Oh no, this guy who wrote this wrote this this way." I believe this book is divinely put together. So let's look at that sentence as we understand it. Is 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 a they use it a couple times, and here on page twenty eight, last paragraph. Everybody at twenty eight. Just to concur, like we're not talking out of our ass here, right? Like we're talking, this is something that we need to get our head wrapped around. And we agnostics, they talked about when presented with new ideas, how willing are we to change our point of view or to conform what's being presented? Or am I going to stick with my own thinking that isn't based on anything? Right? So last, last uh, paragraph. What do you got there, Kim? In the following chapter, there appears an explanation of alcoholism as we understand it. As we understand it, we. right? As we understand it. So, step three, made a decision to turn our will and life over the care of God as we understood him collectively. A lot of people go, well, no, I. No, you're not doing the steps on the wall. They already did the steps. They're talking in their experience. Collectively, we admitted this thing. Collectively, we came to believe. Collectively, we made a decision. Collectively, we went through this, maybe individually, a different place, but we went through this. And as the result of these steps, we've had a spiritual experience What this whole thing is about. So when they get to 45, they talk about here, this, 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 you want to read that again? Lack of power. Lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live. Live, live. So they're really cool. See the correlation between new power and living, right? And it had to be a power greater than ourselves. Obviously, but where and how were we to find this power? Well, that's exactly what this book is all about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. Help you solve your problem or solve your problem? Will solve. So what's our biggest dilemma right now that needs to be solved? 
at this stage of the game, so it's very specific. A lot of people will say, well, here, they'll go, me, I'm, I'm the, no, that's not the, the dilemma. That's not our biggest dilemma at this stage of the game. They're very specific of what needs to be solved at this stage of the game if I'm going to recreate my life. If I'm going to find a way of living, I need to find this thing. There's a dilemma that's standing in the way of me recreating my life at this stage of the game. There's one thing that's most paramount that happens in my life. If it doesn't happen, I'm going to die an alcoholic death. It's just a matter of time. What's that one dilemma? Lack of power. Yeah, but in what way? To create this psychic change or spiritual experience, right? So the, we say, if I, they, the people that went before me said, as the result of tapping into this power, they got this relationship. As the result of this relationship, they experienced a psychic change or spiritual experience, right? Then they were able to recreate their lives. Are you able to recreate your lives before the psychic change or spiritual experience? Or are you able to make a start? And they talked about that. Some people made a beginning, but they failed to enlarge in their spiritual life. And they found themselves drunk in rapid successions. Remember those guys in the book here? So, obviously, that's what this book is about. So as we went through the fourth, the first time, step three we seen was an idea on page 63 of what could be possible. Right? Based on the experience of those that went before us. We see on 63, step 3 is an idea. A lot of people think the top of page 63 is the step 3 promise, right? Well, yeah, they promise these things will happen if you go through the rest of the steps. It isn't happening in this stage of the game. Because if you're able to experience step 3 as it's laid out here in step 3, if you're able to experience these things, would you need to do the rest of the steps? If you were to enter this relationship that they say that's possible here on page 63 with a power greater than yourself, or if you have this change as the result of doing this prayer, this surrender, this acceptance, this third step prayer every day, if we could have that relationship, then would we need to do the rest of the steps? No. So we got to be careful because remember, there's a part of our brain that makes sense to us. Because we're driven by a hundred forms of fear and self-delusion. We have a lot of non-fact-based information that we rest our lives on. <laughs> so these guys who are taking me through this 11 years in and out, they said, man, you've been, like, I'll give them all these ideas, these catch catchphrases, these, these cornerstones in, in my thinking and my belief system. And they'd go, show me where you get this idea from. Uh, uh. I got it from that guy that sounded really good at the last meeting. Everybody laughed, so I picked. I, I started saying what he was saying, and then I said it long enough where I believed I was actually having that experience. What, what made you realize that you weren't having that experience? Can I have my 24-hour chip, please? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, what smashes our delusion is reality. Anybody? So I need to formulate this relationship. So the fourth step begins that. There's a series of prayers and, and actions that I need to take. And I learned how to incorporate these things within inside of myself. Not fully developed them, but I started learning how to master resentment, outgrow fear, and to have the right idea for my conduct for the future. I learned how to meditate. I learned how to do a self-assessment. I learned all these things through the four steps. I, I seen how my conduct has hurt other people. I have all these things. In the fifth step... I removed the blocks that were in my way of this relationship or my life force, this thing deep down within, right? And so that's what they talk about the fifth step is about, right? Having had, having made our personal relation inventory. What does that say, Kim? Page 72. 72. Having made our personal inventory, what shall we do about it? We have been trying to get a new attitude, a new relationship with our creator, and to discover the obstacles in our path. So when they say a new relationship, you ever go out with somebody? Anybody ever been in a nightmare of a relationship here? Nobody? How many people have been in a relationship that nearly killed you? Other than with yourself. I'm, I'm actually talking about another human being here. Anybody ever been in a relationship where you're just begging, begging for relief? How many people? And then the person leaves or you leave and as you're leaving, they go, well, you're never going to find anybody like me. And you go, I hope not. 
I hope not. That's the whole point. I hope I never find somebody like you. Right? <laughs> because, because I do not want to have the same, re- I want new relationships. When we did that inventory process, we seen that it's possible for us to have new relationships with people, places, and things. Right? Isn't it? So here they're saying the same kind of attitude is, I need a new relationship and a new experience. I need to move from my understanding of how I see things or doctrine or teaching or old ideas into a new experience. I need to be able to sidestep that old teaching to be able to have a new experience. Because my old teaching would never allow me to have the relationship that I have with my wife. If I would have still maintained those old ideas and old teachings, my wife would have never... We would have never got together. But based on new understanding and new relationships, I'm able to formulate. A di- it's kind of like the same idea, right? So then we, we kind of do the fifth step. And they talk about on 75. But we may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. You see the theme through this whole thing is about the experience. It's moving from the thinking aspect or the, the, the kind of... Um, behavioral approach to a spiritual approach, to an experience of something that resides deep down within. So that when they talk about that on page 75, they kind of, they talk about as we go down here, when they talk about the feeling of the drink problem has disappeared. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. What's more important, the belief or my thinking or the experience? You're muted, Joe. The experience. The experience, yeah. Right? right? The experience. Because the idea is it, it makes me feel good, but it's not enough to sustain me through my own life. I need to... Any Anybody ever drive in a storm here? Oh, yeah. How many people have been in a car in a storm or drove in a storm or been... So, what usually happens is based on your teaching... You have certain, you you won't be able to to kind of get through it. You'll be crippled by. But based on your experience, the experience of having gone through that or seeing somebody go, you go back to the basics to get you through the storm. You go back on the experience of grabbing the wheel, turning the music down, and paying attention. Everybody sits up. You ever notice that? You turn the radio down, and everybody becomes quiet, and you go with the experience of the driver to get you through this. And a lot of times, you'll go against certain principles that make sense, like the idea of when you're sliding right in snow. I don't know if anybody's ever driven on snow or ice, is and you want a corner, you take your foot off the brake in order to make the corner which doesn't make sense right but once you experience it's kind of like oh yeah so what happens is if a driver's never experienced that they're going into the corner and they got their foot on the brake they'll keep their foot on the brake everything will tell them to maintain the course of action and hopefully they'll stop and they'll slide off the road i don't know if anybody's seen that in movies or whatever it's kind of like you, you get so this is like the kind of thing they're talking about you're going to learn certain principles that may not make sense but when applied will do what seems impossible it'll allow you to have a different experience than the experience you're heading for right and so this relationship started 76 talks about reconfirming this Page 77 talks about our real purpose is to fit ourselves. A lot of people leave the word out fit. A lot of people say uh, our job is to be of maximum service to God and the people around us. To fit means to make effort. It's going to take effort. We don't like effort, do we? We have measure types. Yeah. Well, there's a hockey game on tonight. Yeah. Well, it's your home group. There's new people there. Yeah, well, somebody else could look after them. There's a phone shift. Oh, well, you know, I'm kind of, you know, nobody really calls. Well, there's a 12-step list. Well, more qualified people can do it. There's that new person at the home group nobody talks to. Yeah, there's a reason for it. Just leave them alone. <laughs> you know, like it takes effort to... Yeah, how many people have been to a meeting here where you're all with your buddies and everybody and there's a couple new people shaking the rough, maybe not smelling too good, not looking too good. And you see them inside of you, you see them. Something says go over, but you make an excuse not to or you get busy doing something else. Anybody? We all do it. 
right? To fit yourself means something inside has talked to you. You go over and say, hey, you know what? The best I can do maybe is offer you a coffee, let you know you're welcome here. There's literature or maybe introduce you to some. But the fit is to be of, takes a bit of, a, a bit of work. So we went through last week, step 10. How many people found that interesting last week's, uh, I mean, Tuesday's uh, 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 um, uh, input from the book? You notice we just used the book, eh? Yeah. Right? Now, and, and how many people really had to really open their mind to see what the book was saying? How many people argued a bit with what the book was saying based on what they were taught through other people in the fellowship and, and these these generic answers, you know? I do steps 10, 11, and 12 every day, right? I do step 10, I do step 10, I do step... I, I st- like, step, what that means is when I do step 10 every day, I'm in counsel with me every day. That's what's... Right? Because if you're focusing on you, who are you in counsel with? Problem. <laughs> yeah, and when you see there's a problem, it's usually too late. Yeah. Anybody ever uh, get caught speeding here in a car? Usually when you see the radar, it's usually too late, eh? Yeah. Right? So that's self-awareness. That's why you got to get those little beepers. No, anyways, moving on. <laughs> you need to get a spiritual beeper. Beep, 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 beep. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anyhow. So 83 is, is, is the, the thing. They said, so 82, they said, this is what brought us here. Now we're going to give you a new concept. We're going to start a new conversation here. And this is the best place to start up because it really leads into, remember how they started 10? It says, right, this thought, this thought of what? Of this development, of what? Of our nines and continuing on. But I don't have the recipe on how to do that. This is really cool. The spiritual life is not a theory. Right? Yeah. Kim? What? Oh, sorry. Page 85. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was on 83. Okay. okay. Yeah, me too. I was somewhere. Um, we're we're going to go. It's easy to let up on the spiritual program of action. Yeah, yeah. It's easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. Anybody here? Anybody. Mistaken feeling better for getting better, and I could just ride feeling better because I'm going to feel better for the rest of my life. <laughs> Anybody? And then slowly you're in counsel with who? Me. Yourself. And slowly you can't even stand you anymore. You think it's everybody around you. But when you can't stand you, nobody around you has a chance, do they? No. You just eat them up like, uh, like a tornado. <laughs> I remember looking at this guy when I was doing was So what's your problem? My friend goes, leave him alone. He's blind, man. What's the matter with you? <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I had a lot of problems when I was new. Okay, go ahead. Well, he's staring at me. I didn't know. Okay. Wow. Self-reliance. Yeah. Okay. It is easy. We, we are headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle foe. We are not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. So what do they say maintains this shift? In, in So before we got here, we see we have an alcoholic mind, Right. That's the second symptom is the malady that centers in the mind that they started that conversation off on page 23. It was the first introduction to this thought that our main problem centers in the mind, right? It's not the obsession, right? The obsession is an association with people who still think they can drink or alcohol is still the solution. They really haven't done step one. Once you do step one and smash the idea that you can never safely drink again, then the obsession should take care of itself. Prayer, prayer or whatever, going to a meeting when you have that desire. When Bill had that problem of wanting to drink again, the obsession returning, right? What did he do? He applied these principles and went and worked with somebody, right? And overrode it. When they talked at the top of the page, when, when tempted, when tempted, that means there's a moment when you're tempted to do something, That there's a moment of contemplation there, isn't there? 100%. So based on truth, you could smash the idea, hey, you know what, I can't drink. I'm allergic to it. I can't safely drink. I could recoil from it. Like a hot flame. Right? But if I'm spiritually not well, 
and the insanity returns, what can I do about it? Nothing. Nothing. So we see that there's a shift in my thinking somewhere where the alcoholic mind has been removed. Right? It's, it's cast to one side if you want to say it. As long as I stay spiritually fit, it won't return. If I diminish my spiritual condition, what returns? It's the, the idea. The idea, or not, not only the idea, the alcoholic mind returns. There's a shift in my thinking that I can't see, feel, and touch that they explained on page 37. It's a phenomenon. Because if you could see it coming, if you could see relapse coming, then we just work on the steps then, right? Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't need to do it all the time. You hear people say, in hindsight, they go, oh, I've seen it coming. No, you didn't. No. You can't. Well, can I add something there? You can. Well, that's, and that's why I like how they use the word alcohol is a subtle foe. And it's really, when you read what it says in the, in the old English and, and uh, in the 1935, it means a, a lurking enemy or very, not easily understood. Right. So it, the, what happens is we, we feed people the, the delusion that you can keep on guard from this thing when really you can't see a guy in full camo gear hiding in your bush. And, and it's just right. Yeah, and who puts them there? Is we do. We put the guys in the bushes. So one, one of the things when they talk about daily reprieve is I don't know what exactly the combination of things I need to stop doing in order to get loaded. But I know the combination of things that I knew that, that keep me sober, right? I know those combination of things. And I've been doing those things and, and branching off on them for the last 31 years. When somebody showed me this recipe and we got to where we are here, I understood what they were saying here is we want to be able to see this shift. Oh, I've got to watch when I'm irritable, restless, and discontent. Wait a minute. What about that guy with not a cloud on the horizon? Things were going fantastic. So, right. so it's, it's, it's the, the deception that I'll be able to see this thing. So they need to give us a recipe or a formula that I get to see when I'm off track. You know, it's like in my truck, when, and if my tires aren't working so well, I'll have an indicator will tell me this tire is down, this tire is, and this is kind of like what we need with our own selves. Like there's a monitor, there's indications within my vehicle to let me know I'm headed for trouble or there's a problem with the system. The light is not the problem. The indicator on the dash uh, that tells me my tire pressure, if I turn it off, the problem's still there. If I put a black piece of tape over the red light that says engine light and disguise it, the problem's still there. That's the way we deal with things. Oh, let it go. Put black tape over it. The problem's gone. Because yeah. we're, we're illusionists. Any illusionist here? Yeah. Watch this magic trick. It's all gone. <laughs> I just let it go, right? Life's getting ready to give you another notice, right? That's the beauty about life is. you. Can, anyways, so they're saying here, the only thing that's going to keep me from this fate is being spiritually connected, right? And so I need to learn a recipe like my car has a data system or a GPS that lets me know I'm, I'm on track. So how many people have, have ever used the GPS here? Right, so the first thing you do when you get a GPS, you plug it in, it's powered up, it works well, is you punch in the location of one, where you want to go, right? Then what's the first thing the GPS does? It finds out where you are. It has to know where you are. And so with us, where's the spiritual start deep down within? We have to have the pause to come back. Where's God? In the now. Here. So I need to learn a recipe like my GPS that when I'm off track, it goes beep, 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 recalculating, beep, beep, recalculating. And if I ignore it for too long, I don't have that in step 10. What I have is conflict with other people to let me know that I'm off track. If you're new, you're not only in conflict with yourself, you're still in conflict with everybody around you. Anybody? Especially family and friends, people close to you. You still have that part of your brain to, to grouch in a brainstorm a bit that you need to really pray and do restraint at a time, keep your mouth shut. Anybody have that problem in early sobriety? 
<laughs> Keeping our mouth shut is not our strong suit, is it, people? <laughs> okay. So here, I need to formulate this thing, this GPS, with this, my, my life guidance GPS, God's prayer system. I need that formulated within San Jose because my old GPS would lead me back to where I used to go. Right? The old way would say go this way. And I don't know if you've ever been on a GPS where you're going a certain way and the road's closed because it's hazardous to go that way. It's unsafe to go that way. You see the sun, so you go a different way. Right? And everything says go this way. You're going that way. Your GPS is still going, no, go the other way. Go the other way. Go the other way. Anybody been there? Right? But you have to go this way. That's like these spiritual principles of these terms. I have to go this way. But everything is saying go that way. Everything's saying fear-based, instinct-based, still responding this way. So everything's saying, the anxiety's saying go this way, but the new teaching is saying go this way, right? And as you go along, somewhere along the road, the GPS will switch over to your new route, and the old route will be removed. You'll be on a new system, a new route. Does that kind of make sense? Now, if I don't maintain spiritual principles the old root starts recalculating itself back to the old root, and I don't know that because I'm just following the directions of what's being presented. I can't tell the truth from the false. I'm starting being directed by instinct again. I'm no longer checking the viable signs around me. So I need to learn that kind of thing. So it's easy to let up. We're headed for trouble if we do. Is that kind of a good explanation of where we're going with this thing? Okay. What? Let's go with what? What we really have. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Not on our memory, not on the pain, not on step one, not on yesterday. Those things are not enough for people like us. If they were enough, a lot of us have a lot more support. Remember, we can't remember. Remember? Remember we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, and powerful. People go, what's the most important part there? They go, cunning, baffling. No, remember, we can't remember. Remember? That's what I said. Remember, you can't remember. Remember? Oh, yeah, I remember. <laughs> no, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all our activities. How can I best serve thee? Thy will, not mine, be done. These are thoughts which must go with us constantly. So you we see there, sorry. Yeah. So what, what we see there is step three has shifted. Step three, I'm turning my will and my life over because I don't have direction or connection or, or this relationship. I'm asking that this thing be taken from me that's killing me, alcoholism. So in step three is the starting of this. Now it's saying I have this relationship. It's up to me how I want to govern myself. When I do step three, it's not to remind God, it's to remind me. When, we, when people are married, why they wear a ring, it's not to remind the people around them, it's to remind themselves. So when people say, I do step three every day, well, what they're saying is, I don't really have this relationship yet, and I still need to remind myself of this commitment that I made, right? Because now that I'm married, for the length of time that I'm married, I don't wake up every morning going, oh, hi, are we still married? Like We're, we're in a relationship. We, like, if I did that, it, it would be a problem. We just had our 11-year anniversary. and said, well, should we go for another year or what? So, like, before we got married, we made the commitment that this was going to be a lifelong endeavor. That's what step three is. It's a lifelong endeavor, right? I'm going to formulate this thing, right? So, that's what they're saying here now. I got my will back. So, quit blaming God for the shit you do. Your people must be God's will. No, no, no. You, you, you're the problem. If there's a problem in your life, guess who's probably orchestrated it? Well, you don't have to be insensitive about that. <laughs> right? How many people are really attracted to drama here? Put your hands down. We do. Especially in new sobriety. You know why we like drama, anxiety? Because it creates a diversion from ourselves. We're addicted to the endorphins. Anybody ever get mad? By themselves. How many people have lost their stuff by themselves? Oh, yeah. If you had somebody watching you at different times when you were alone, would people go, whoa, 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 whoa. 
Well, I'm not any good drywallers here. Yeah, near trash it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> red I'm room, red room. Okay. For anybody that knows drywallers, that's always on the. <laughs> yeah, hit one stud. I can drywall. <laughs> okay. These are thoughts which must go with us constantly. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. It is the proper use of the will. Sit, circle that. It's the proper use of the will. Have they showed us how to do the proper use of the will yet? They showed us how to create change, but they really haven't shown us to, to, to put it all together. So what happens is somebody's taught you all the bases about driving now. You get in the car, you know how to work the clutch, you know how to get it out of, out of neutral in the first and get inside. You know all the bases. Now, now you're about to put it all together and get on the road. You still got that person beside you. They're going to say, we're going to take all these things and we're going to get you to the next level. Because staying in the field or staying in the parking lot isn't enough. It won't. It's not the, the means of this whole thing. The whole means of it is to get you out there driving and, and mixing within the rest of the world and be of service to God and the people around us, right? So much. Okay. Much has already been said about receiving strength, inspiration, and direction from him who has all knowledge and power. If we have carefully followed directions, we have begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us. That power, that connection within. How many people would say, yeah, you know what? I could do... I could define that at different times now. I know what it means for me now because it's personal for me. Now, you get to describe it in your own language what that means to you. And as you describe it, the rest of it, yeah, 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 I have the same thing. I have this internal thing. What you call it is secondary. It's the experience, right? To some extent, we have become God conscious. Move from the thinking into the consciousness. We have begun to develop this vital sixth sense. How many senses do humans have? Five. Now we have a sixth sense. We've always had it, but it got blocked by resentment, fear, calamity, and the pursuit of self. That's how come we ended up lost, is we think we you have a list of everything that's going to make us feel better that makes us feel worse. As soon as I have recovery, as soon as I get rid of the pursuit of self, when we get those things, we sit and we like we lie there in loneliness. I don't know if anybody heard that song, Hurt by Johnny Cash. Yeah. He's sitting there and he says, you can have my empire. You can have it all, my gold records. And he's pouring his drink all over the table. He says, at the end of the road, He's saying what he wouldn't give to go back and do the things that meant the most. At the end of the day, he had an empire of dust, this big kingdom that he built that I thought would give him happiness, and he was dying of loneliness in his last days. Yeah. So in hindsight, the beauty of where you're at in your life is you're starting this new process is that doesn't have to be my fate. Right? I could re-emphasize the, the essence of life here and this thing deep down within. Like, a lot of you guys heard my duck story with the the quack quack. Man, I still say that all over the place. Like, I've been all over the world, but I I still, it's one of those moments that just make life. Anyways, okay? We have begun to develop (laughs) this vital sixth sense, but we must go further, and that means more action. So we're not staying here. It doesn't say we're going further, but we must go further. Why? Because it's easy to let up on a spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. To get into the mechanics of it. To get back on self-focus or self-working on self. It's never been about self-working on self. That's the delusion that self creates. That's the delusion that the treatment centers created that infiltrated the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm working on myself. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm working on this character defect. I'm working on that, that character defect. That's not what it says we work on here. If we work on the relationship, everything else takes care of itself. Step 11 suggests prayer and meditation. We shouldn't be shy on this matter of prayer. Better men than we are using it constantly. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. Work at what? What are we working at? Prayer and meditation. So they're going to show us how to develop it. What does step 11 say? Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our 
contact. conscious contact with God as we understood him, this power source that resides within as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power, power to carry this out. Because if I'm not connected to power, who's in trouble? If I can, but I don't got a gas gauge on my spiritual barometer. When I look at my car, I can see where I am and how much mileage I have. I don't have that in regards to spiritual terms in my sobriety. That's why they say it's a daily reprieve. If I could rest two weeks and then build up spiritually again, then I guess who would rest two weeks and then build up spiritually again? How many people would just do enough to get them by? It said it in the book, I'd be doing it. <laughs> Right. Okay. And it would be easy to be vague about this matter, yet we believe we can make some definite and valuable suggestions. When we retire at night, we constructively review our day. So you notice that? You notice that? Is that we finish six and seven, we read through eight and nine, the review. We we come up to step ten. It says here in step ten, what did it say, Joe? It says step ten. Which part? The first part, the introduction to step ten. This thought brings us to step. This 10. thought, and then we read through it. Now is the instruction when at night. You notice it didn't start in the morning. At night. When is it starting? When is step eleven starting? At night. At night. A lot of people say it's step 10 at night. That 12 and 12, God bless those people that put it together. It wasn't built. It was that other guy. I think it caused more confusion around Tom this Powell. thing. Huh? Tom, Tom, Tom Powers wrote it more Christian. Big. So in our big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, when we retire at night, it's not step 10. It's all the summary of the whole course of action we've done up to this point in time that allows us to do an assessment of what's going on with self, the meditation part. So when we retire at night, we constructively review our day. And so when you constructively review, you go quiet like you did in the fifth step after before reviewing the first five proposals. You sit quietly and your conscience will let you know if you've done something or not. A lot of people do 11 step checklist like somebody else's step 11 checklist. It's not a mechanical thing. You need to see Develop your consciousness with your power, your relationship. Remember what I talked about in 10. We have entered the world of the spirit. Our next function is to grow an understanding of the effectiveness of what? Of this relationship. If you're mechanically in your brain and not tapping into your consciousness to allow that to talk to you, it's easily it's easy to do one of those 11-step checklists and writing and writing. Who are you stuck on? It's like that old Band-Aid commercial. I'm stuck on Band-Aids and Band-Aids stuck on me, right? You know, remember that commercial? We love yeah. that commercial, right? I'm stuck on step 10 and step 10 stuck on me. <laughs> <laughs> right? So it's kind of like we need to get you out of the way. We need to keep you out of the way so you can enjoy your life. Because when you show up, it's not good. Anybody? So... Does anybody want to be around you when you show up? <laughs> Here's Johnny. Okay. Yeah. That was fun. Were we? Were we resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? Do we owe an apology? <clears throat> so when, when those things happen, those are not the problem. They're symptoms of the problem. Yeah. Right? They let us know there's an indication that something has interfered with one of my spiritual, with one of my instincts. Yeah. And I reacted. And that lets me know I'm spiritually off. I don't work on those things. What I do is go work on my spiritual connection to get relief from these things. It's like when, when you have a pain in your tooth, the pain is not the problem. It's an indicator that there's an underlying problem. This, the pain is the symptom. The symptom is... Right, the dishonest self is resentful because now uh, an instinct's taken over, and I'm reacting to that. Does that kind of make sense? So that yeah. lets me know going backwards through the steps. Okay. Have we kept something to ourselves which should be discussed with another person at once? At once. What does that once mean? Right mm -hmm. now. Yeah, we like keeping secrets, eh? The hardest part about sobriety is humility. 
Because a lot of us get sober a little while and we really don't like telling on ourselves. We really don't like to admit we still have the human factor going here. We don't really like the idea that we struggle. We don't really like the idea that this human element is kicking my ass and I'm having a hard time reconnecting with source. That's why when we work with sponsors or we walk with each other, what we do is we carry each other back to the spiritual, right? Some days I just can't do it. Like I remember I went to a meeting and, and I just got up and, and everybody, I said, you know what? I'm not doing really well. I said, there's a lot of stuff happening in my life. I really, I really, really depleted. I'm not doing well at all. And everybody was shocked that I would say that from the meeting. They said, well, you've been sober. Well, I, like, I was probably 29 years sober at the time. And I won't get into what was happening. But I went to a meeting with my ass in hand. And I just sat down. And what two members of Alcoholics Anonymous did, they didn't come up and start asking me questions. They came and sat beside me, one on, one on each side. And just had coffee and we had fellowship and we talked and I got back to the source because I was able to go through these things with another member of Alcoholics Anonymous that got me reconnected by exhibiting some humility. Okay. Were we kind and loving toward all? <laughs> we could use some work around that, can't we people? Anybody? <laughs> Even toward ourselves. Were we kind and loving toward ourselves? Don't just focus on that. Oh, no, I love loving myself. No, it's not that kind okay. of meeting. Okay, keep going. <laughs> what could we have done better? That's a good question, right? Mm -hmm. but, so when you review that, if you look at something, what you could have done better, when this situation arises again, then your intuitiveness will tell you, you need to monitor your energy. You can't monitor your thinking. Because you're thinking you'll be deceived by it. But if you monitor your energy, the anxiety, fear, that, that little before something happens, how many people get a shift in their energy? And then they're thinking. So if you could tap into that before it happens or be aware that it's happening and take corrective measures, will it change the outcome of that situation? Will you have a different experience than you did the last time in that same situation? 100%. So the second half of how we're works talks about the principles we have set down are guides to progress we claim spiritual progress not behavioral progress because i could be in a meeting smiling at you and when i was new and smiling at you and i've so changed it inside this thing <laughs> anybody anybody sit there and smile at somebody oh i'm so spiritual and then one day you just can't take it anymore and you let them have it for the two weeks you're nice to them they're talking about change inside. A change means not to carry anymore. The diffusing of energy that used to care, mastering resentment, overcoming fear, changing my response to life by dissipating the energy I carry with inside of me, reharnessing these things instead of making them landmines within me. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Yep. Um, and would, would this not tie into something, because I just think that you rang it out so beautifully there was, and also how it works when they say uh, they are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. Are we not being honest in our 11s at that moment? See, I think there's something different here. Because you're moving from the thinking into your consciousness. But that, I, I get that, and I'm, yeah. all, I'm, all I'm putting out there... I'm grasping and developing this step. Am yes. I not? Yes. Right? Yeah. Which, which, which the honesty is, is, is when you're quiet, can you hear what your, self, what your conscious is telling you? That's, yeah, that's what I'm getting that, at. That's the, that, like, I hear what you're saying. That's what I'm, but a lot of people will do a mental assessment mm -hmm. and not tap into their consciousness. That's what I was saying. They do this 11-step thing that somebody else put in a checklist, and they, they're, in, they're doing an intellectual approach well actually tony they got an app now well yeah see what happens is this is your conscious where your conscious will talk to you you need to develop there's a big difference remember in your four when you had to resent all these things that came to the surface you're kind of wow where did that stuff came from it came from within that intuitiveness comes from where from within okay yep thank you were we thinking of ourselves most of the time? That's why people love step 10 and not so much 11. 
Because <laughs> if you're doing 10 every day, who are you thinking about? Me. Me, 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 me. And I'll bring God into it when I, I think there's a problem. Yeah. You, you won't even be, like, I guarantee 100% you wouldn't have prayed for one person or one thought for someone else in that entire day. Okay. Yep. Yeah. What do you got, Kim? Or were we thinking of what we could do for others, of what we could pack into the stream of life? So what's our what's our purpose now? To be to fit ourselves to be maximum service to God and the people around us, and through that pursuit, it gives us a life beyond anything we could ever imagine. Back in we agnostic, we said God made these things possible. Those who haven't experienced it or understand it just smiled when these guys talked to me about this 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 new realm that they entered and the life they were living and God provided all that. I thought they lost. I thought, Oh my God, is this the only, is this, there was no other place for me to go. I thought these guys were nuts. Like they were talking. I was like, Oh my God, where's Jack Nicholson? So like, where's the yellow bus? Like, and then as the years went on, everything they told me that I thought were right off the rocker, I've come to pass to sound like those same people. I'm on the right side of crazy today, and I wouldn't have my life any other way. I've looked for what I've got now my whole life, and I would have never got it on my own. It took me ruining my life <laughs> to a point where you people actually looked appealing to me, which is kind of interesting. A bunch of <laughs> coming alcoholics, and uh, if you want what I have, <laughs> look at you people. Are you kidding me? Is there anybody else here I can go with? No, we're it. <laughs> How do you like us so far? <laughs> Stop crying, Tony. It gets better. No, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> but we must be careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection. What does that mean, morbid reflect? Any morbid reflectors here? Looking back, how many people like beating themselves up here? Yeah, a the speech. narrator, you're allowing it to de determine the story instead of pausing, re praying. And I'm going to show you some really interesting stuff when we go through here. It's a game changer, okay? For that would diminish our usefulness to others. After making our review, we ask God's for God. We ask God's forgiveness and inquire what corrective measures should be taken. Why? Why would we do that? That that. Uh, that act of asking God, the creator, for forgiveness. That means we don't have to carry anymore, right? That means if the creator is done, I've passed it over, I'm done. The only one who carries it from here would be me, and that would be more of a reflection after that. That means, well, I haven't done my penance. A lot of us like serving penance, guilt, shame, and remorse. Anybody? When mm -hmm. I've served my penance after beating myself up and I've done my time, then I'll move on. They're, no, they're saying here, as soon as you acknowledge it and you're willing to move toward better things, leave it alone and move forward. Corrective, corrective, corrective as we go. It's like one of those boat launch things. You ever, the click, 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 you're getting a boat out of the swamp, right? You need to get it out of there. What happens is the click is, is forgiveness moving in a new area and boats having a different experience what we want to do is take that part off the click so hang on to it what it wants to do is retract back in the water so you hear people say it's two steps forward three steps back right here they're saying no let's just keep moving forward and di and we'll get into some really interesting stuff but circle out of that what do they mean here and inquire what corrective measures should be taken i was i don't know how many years sober the first time i seen that and i thought what are they asking what corrective measures should be taken? This is step 11. It's asking us what corrective measures should be taken. What corrective measures would I be taking here or seeking? That means I've, I've entered these situations more than once. Anybody been in a situation more than once? It seems to repeat itself. It seems yeah. to be a theme. People say, oh, it's a, uh, oh, whatever. Uh, uh, what's that word they use in treatment is, is people... Patterns, patterns, that's it, patterns, patterns and triggers, and ah, I'm just, it's like the Wizard of Oz. Oh, my, <laughs> how does that go? <laughs> bears, lions, and tags, and bears, oh, my, <laughs> the Wizard of Oz. Anyways, I'm having a squirrel moment. I'm reeling it back in. This is not the yellow brick road. We're not looking after all those things. Here they're asking what corrective measures should be taken. In other words, if I was on slippery stairs and I fell, 
and I had to go back down those stairs the next day, what corrective measures would be? I'd hang on to the handrail and take my time going down them a bit more based on experience of what happened. Because I have, if I got into a situation with a person, place, or thing, I'd assess what got me, what instinct got me into that hot situation where I wasn't able to conduct myself rightly, and I'd ask for corrective measures as I go along. So what that kind of means is a real an example of that. Um, the, the, in our marriage, one, one of the areas that used to cause me a, a lot of problems was talking financial. I don't know why it, a lot of, had to do with, uh, um, anyways, so um, we talk about finances and bills. And that my energy, I just start, I, sometimes I just kind of lose it. And then I'd apologize afterwards, right? And then we'd sit down and do it again. And then I'd lose it again. I just found myself just like driven by these things. So when I seen this thing probably 11 years ago, I go, what corrective risk? That meant when I'm sitting there and we're talking, what that meant is I feel the energy starting to change. And what I do is I say, you know what? Could we revisit this? I'm starting to get instinct based here. I'm starting to get some anxiety. Would you mind if we revisit this later so I can kind of get my mind set around this? And what we do now is we make appointments around heavy issues or heavy situations. Now it's financial is a piece of cake. But for for topics or situations that are emotionally driven or potentially emotion driven, what we do is corrective measures is we say, hey, Tuesday, would you like to get together? Let's have coffee around six and we're going to talk about these things. Could you be emotionally and mentally prepared for this? Yes, yeah, so we don't Shanghai each other, right? And we say, that's the corrective measures. And when in the conversation, I'm able to say, can we just hold it a second here? I need to kind of re I'm having some anxiety. I don't have to know why I'm having the anxiety. I'm just having anxiety and I don't want to react to you the way I used to anymore. I want a different response or different outcome here. And so what what my wife, my kids and people around me would help me do was would help me to have a different experience. But I would tell them about the, the problem, me and the challenges that I have in these situations, I'd make them aware of it, and they'd help me navigate through it. Does that kind of make sense? This is pretty powerful stuff. When you're telling on yourself and you let people around you know, it's not an excuse for your behavior. What it is is they're going to help you mature through this or learn a different way of functioning in it. Okay? On awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. We consider our plans for the day. Before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking, especially asking that it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. Because a lot of us get up in the morning and we get fear-based. Right away we start thinking, the anticipation. Even going to a work that you've been to or a situation, is just, I don't know why it is, it's just self shows up somehow and starts nattering at you. Anybody? Just here they're saying, you know what, self, just relax for a second, narrator, everybody just sit down and shut up while I talk to God for a second. We're yeah. gonna right, we're gonna adjourn this meeting until I talk to the head poobah. And after I talk to the head poobah, I'm gonna get some direction. Then we can call this meeting in order. But half of you are not gonna be here anymore after I talk <laughs> to the main guy. And the rest of you that are left over, you will conduct yourself in a manner fitting to what I want. Yeah. Does that sound cool? Before the other meeting is, they're all having a meeting and they're inviting me in it and it ain't good. Okay. Under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance. For after all, God gave us brains to use. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. Our thought life. So we won't be instinct-based, fear-based, and driven. We'll just be more living in what's God's will for us. To play the role he assigns work in the here and now. If you just trust as you're doing your nines now, because remember, you're new. Some of us are new when we're new going through. We still have a lot of self in the way. We have our nines. We have all these problems. We have all these things. We have this stuff. And the guys who helped me used to say, you know, when I went back and turned myself in, I was a year and a half sober. And they said, remember, you serve a bigger power than any power you'll stand before. You serve a bigger God than any person, place, or thing 
that you'll stand before. And I kind of always remember that, right? Trust and rely on God. So what happens is in the prayer and meditation is Chuck taught me this. We don't pray for things. We pray about things. There's a difference. Most of us pray for things. This is we pray about things. That we be given what we need to meet the day. Today. Anybody remember that poem, the 24, just for today? Any man can fight or woman can fight the battles of just one day? Is when you and I they used to read that in Ontario all the time. Powerful prayer. Okay? In thinking about our day, we may face indecision. We may not be able to determine which course to take. So Here, listen to that. Listen to that. Okay? In our day, we may face indecision. Anybody have any kind of days like that? Hell, we haven't even put on our shoes yet, and it's gotten complicated. <laughs> Should I bring a raincoat? Should I bring a winter coat? Should I bring a bathing suit? Should I bring sun illusion? Should I? Should I? Should I take the car? Should I take the bus? Should I? Should... <laughs> Anybody that kind of, like? Okay, we may face the indecision. So when we're having an anxiety or a moment of, eh, what do we do? Continue to talk to ourselves? No. We hear, we ask God. So we acknowledge that we're having some difficulty. You know, it kind of makes, sometimes it's, it's really difficult to pick the right shoes. It is. When you're crazy, it, it's a big thing. Like, it's a big thing. Doing little things is a big thing. Anybody? It, like, it takes all the effort we have to do the simplest thing. Like, go to bed. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh, no. <laughs> the some. Hey, you haven't eaten in six hours. Have something to eat. Okay. <laughs> Have you drinking water today? Oh, good idea. <laughs> like, you know, that's like, like, anybody that kind of nuts here, is it just me? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, here they're saying, when you're in conflict with you, when steel is on steel, and it doesn't matter what it is, pause. Pause. And ask God for inspiration and direction. Like, I have guys that phone me and they go, I'm nuts, I'm totally nuts, I don't know what to do. I said, relax. Are you angry or indecisive? He says, I'm really angry. I said, go wash your face with cold water and then come back. So they go wash their face with cold water. I said, pray, come back. I said, no. Are you indecisive? They said, yeah, I don't know what to do. I said, are you staring at your kitchen? They said, yeah. I said, are the dishes piled up past the window? They said, yeah. I said, go do the dishes. Call me when you're done. Click. For me. Well, I didn't see how that was how, but I feel a lot better that the dishes, the, I don't know what to do now. Are you staring at your bedroom? Yeah. Have you done the laundry in the last two months? Well, I don't know how that's going to help. Click. All right. Do what's next. It's not complicated. If you're looking at something and something tells you you should be done. Anybody ever been at a home group and something you see something that needs to be done? How many people have seen that? Oh, this needs to be done in my home group or that needs to be done. What we do is go tell somebody else it needs to be done. <laughs> that was God telling you it needed to be done. Go do it. No, 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 no. I got, I, I got the gift of prophecy. I'm just telling you it needs to be done. I'm not going to actually do it. <laughs> Anyways, you'll find that funny later. One day you'll be at a meeting th seeing something that needs to be done. And you say, hey, excuse me, do you mind? And then, okay, anyways, go ahead. We relax and take it easy. We don't struggle. We are often surprised how the right answers come after we have tried this for a while. Serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity. That's what they're saying here. Right? I need to calm the things that are happening with inside of me. If I can't calm the things with inside of me, there will be no peace for me or anybody around me. So the first place that the calm, that the storm needs to become is in myself. And sometimes that's just stopping and taking a big breath, relieving the anxiety that lets me know I'm overthinking. Fear-based anxiety is that anxiety is fear-based. Is to stop, take a big breath. Be where my feet are. Okay, God, what do you want me to do? When in doubt, phone somebody or go to a meeting or go to bed or do something. Right? Okay. What used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. So what needs to become a working part of the mind? This recipe. 
Yeah. Upon awakening, when we retire at night, these questions, this connecting with source, went into connecting to God, not conversations with me all the time. I pray that you guys stay sober long enough that, that you have this happen. One night I, w- I was having a, a trouble sleeping. I guess I was having a nightmare or some conflict in my sleep. My wife says, you know, that was really funny. I said, what? She says, you started praying in your sleep. You couldn't, you couldn't, you're having some form of conflict. You're jousting and running, like doing something. And then you just started praying in your sleep. I said, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I, serious. You could ask her. You what? No. <laughs> I, I wouldn't lie to you about that. that. That's pretty well. It becomes a working part of the mind. Absolutely. It's just the, the, the pausing, right? Because when to pursue would mean your own care. You know the fight or flight, right? The yeah. fight means my life depends on it. The, pa- the, 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 the pause means the freeze. When to move would be my own conflict, my own demise. We need that pause, okay? Being still inexperienced and having just made conscious contact with God. There's that conscious contact again, the experience, right? It is not probable that we are going to be inspired at all times. <laughs> Wait till you experience that. It'll be funny. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a humility. Uh, oh, yeah. That's right there, yeah. We might pay for this presumption in all sorts of absurd actions and ideas. So what that means, and just for people like me that was young when I got here, when I finally got sober, is I see something very appealing, and I pray to God, oh, please, God, can I have her? Please, I'll be so... It'll be so... Uh, my... Concentration prayer is all about having a relationship with this woman. And then we get together. She's in treatment. We get together. And it's, it's a God thing. Because obviously God brought us together. Do you feel what I'm feeling? Yes, I'm feeling it too. Oh, it's so, it's, it's, I, do you hear the angels? I hear them too, right? And then after a while, I realized there weren't angels. They were sirens, man. <laughs> I was like, so it took twice as many prayers to get, right? For God, please take her back. It took twice as many prayers to get rid of her as it did the keeper. And I'm sure there's been a couple that had the same thing. Oh, my God, look at that handsome devil. Boy, he's new in sobriety. I'm looking for a mate. I'm five years. That girl, she was five years sober. She thought, wow, what a catch. Because I was on my best behavior at the dance, dressed up, not saying nothing. After a couple months, she went, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Anyways, pay for these things. Nevertheless, we find that our thinking will, as time passes, be more and more on the plane of inspiration. Rising above the instinctual basis that they talked about earlier. We rise up to a different different, uh, energy field. I don't know how else to say that, right? More clear. We come to rely upon it. We usually conclude the period of meditation with a prayer that we be shown all through the day what our next step is to be, that we be given whatever we need to take care of such problems. We ask especially for freedom from self-will and are careful to make no request for ourselves only. As we go through the day, so imagine if you were living in 11, how would your life look if you were practicing these principles? Awesome. Would it look a lot different than if you're just doing 10? You can see this is way different than 10. This is showing us what they talked about. These are thoughts that must go constantly. This is the recipe. This is what this whole thing is about. What treatment center people don't like is is they like the idea of working on themselves. This idea is working on your relationship. The better your relationship becomes, the more conscious you become, the more in, in the now you live, the more present you become, the more happy, joyous, and free you are. You're disconnected from all those things around you of the delusion of life. Okay. We may ask for ourselves, however, if others will be helped. We are careful never to pray on our own selfish ends. Many of us have wasted a lot of time doing that. And it doesn't work. I still do it. God, give me the lottery. You know how many people I can help in your name. (laughs) If you can all pray that I win so I can help people, that will be good too. Okay, sorry. See, we're nuts, eh? 31 January, we we could rationalize anything, okay? You can easily see why. 
If circumstances warrant, we ask our wives or friends to join us in morning meditation. If we belong to a religious denomination which requires a definite morning devotion, we attend to that also. If not members of religious bodies, we sometimes select and memorize a few set prayers which emphasize the principles we have been discussing. Okay, this is really fast. Why would we do that? Emphasize and memorize. Because they'll talk about it in a second. We're undisciplined because the narrator in our mind always talks to us. If you're memorizing prayer. So in early sobriety, I was tormented by me, my thinking, my past, and, and the amends of my future. Right? Like I'd lie down and I'd just be tormented by anxiety and unable to sleep. My sponsor said, I've never met anybody who's ever done the Lord's Prayer three times in a row who hasn't, who hasn't fallen asleep. He's never met anybody who's able to do the Lord's Prayer three times in a row without falling asleep. 31 years later, I still have never been able to do it three times in a row without falling, without falling asleep. I remember going back to him and I said, I've done it three times in a row. He says, no. He used to go like this all the time. He'd go, no. <laughs> you know what I do with you. Okay, so he'd go, let's go over this again. He says, when you were doing the prayer, did you start thinking? I said, yeah. He says, then you didn't meditate. Go back and meditate on the words. I go back and meditate on the words. He says, if you start thinking, like talking to yourself as you pray, you got to go start over again. He says, I've never met anybody who's ever been able to do it three times in a row without falling asleep. Sometimes I want to really think about what I'm thinking, and I don't want to do the prayer. But when I do do the prayer at 2 o'clock in the morning, i got to be up at 6, and I finally do I've never been able to do it three times in a row over the last 31 years. The other one, if, if you don't like that, the other one is walking along the beach, playing frisbee with, with, uh, with uh, 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 any kind of dog of your choice. I, I like a Labrador Retriever, a red one walking along the beach playing frisbee in the water. Being there playing frisbee. I taught my daughter that meditation when, when, she, when she was quite young. We'd talk about that story. She'd concentrate on it and fall asleep. That's what they mean. When you're having trouble in your mind, the serenity prayer, the shifting of energy, ideas, and thoughts. That's why we do the, the concentration of that stuff, okay? Oh, Sermon on the Mount's an awesome book for anybody who's been through this stuff. Mind-boggling book. Power now, all that stuff. That's what they mean. But be quick to see where they're right. Okay. There are many helpful books also. Suggestions about these may be obtained from one's priest, minister, or rabbi. Be quick to see where religious people are right. Make use of what they offer. Okay, have your highlighter out. <laughs> Here we go. Ready? As we go through the day. Not the week. Not the month, okay. as we go through the day. Mm -hmm. Remember what they talked about earlier? Every day, right? Many times each day, they talked about that. These thoughts must go with us constantly. Now they're giving us the recipe on how to do that. As we go through the day, we... Pause. 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 We're able, because we're able to see this because of the four and five, the six and seven, we see these things that cause our problems. It's like, uh-oh, it's like when you're driving your car, those indicators on the road, go, nah. whoa, 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 correct, take corrective measures. You're going into a curb. You see the sign that says, it suggested that you go around this curb at 60, right? There's a stop sign. It suggested that you stop. An amber light actually means slow down and stop if necessary. It doesn't mean speed up and try to make the light. Just saying. If you're in the left lane, right, and you're blocking traffic, get over in the right lane. No, that was me. Sorry. Go ahead. Because <laughs> when I'm driving my bike, it's get out of the way. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. <laughs> As we go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful. And ask for the right thought or action. Wow, imagine if you're able to do that. So that means if you can change the moments, right, in the day. The moment changes the hours. The hours changes the day. The day changes the week. The week changes the month. The month changes the years. 
Pretty soon you look back and you'll have a life beyond anything you could ever imagine. How did you get into the predicament of ending up in a one thought, one moment, one decision at a time that has your life looking the way it did? Now we're doing it in reverse, changing those moments that created the outcome that you got before for a new outcome. Right, And within a few months, you'll have be amazed by the life you're living if you persevere. If we are painstaking with purpose, not thinking. If you're thinking you're going to talk yourself out of happiness, the obstacles will look too big. Here they're saying, bring God into it. Seek this power. Seek knowledge. Seek direction. Seek counsel with other people. You can get through this. How do you know that? Because we got through it. Okay. We constantly remind ourselves we are no longer running the show. Holy smokes. What the hell is the matter with these people? As we go through the day, right? We, we constantly ask for the right thought or action. We constantly remind ourselves. What, why are they asking us to continuously have this conversation with you that, hey, brainwave, what are you doing? They're saying here, basically, if you're going alone, you're in trouble. Constantly reminding yourself here that it's more than about you it's about your relationship right humbly saying to ourselves many times each day thy will be done there's a lot going on in a 24-hour period here eh? we go many times each month right or, or we think this meant oh i prayed in the morning and i prayed at night no no that's not a relationship here they're talking about a relationship. When you're in a relationship, it's 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 a part of you. It becomes a working part of your mind. I'm in a relationship with my wife. We we have a like we're, we're almost we're of the same two different lives having the same life and the same experience. It's kind of weird. We're connected. She's my soulmate. I just we just I just know when things aren't right with her. I know when things are right. And when I know things aren't right with her, and I ignore that, I am not right. When I go away from that, I need to make right. Anybody ever been in a situation where they're ignoring how they feel about something or so something? You're not right within yourself. When you go make right, everything goes in back into the way it was designed to be. And that's what they're talking about here. It's not ignoring what's happening inside of you and correcting it as you go along. Okay? We are then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. See, notice what they use the language there? You notice they didn't say resentment? They said anger. Because resentment is the derivative of untreated anger that carries over into the next day. That's why they said when we retire at night, were we resentful? That I carry this thing where it becomes an inner dialogue, an inner attachment of energy that's associated with another person, place, or thing. To get angry in the moment, and, and you could get angry in the moment and then take corrective measures by pausing and reallocating and being different. Sometimes being different is not dragging somebody else into the dialogue that's happening inside of you, allowing it to be a landmine inside of you instead of a hand grenade. You're not involving another person. You're t containing that energy. Like that, you know, uh, I don't know how else to say it, right? It's like you're putting a container over the, the hand grenade and the explosion is inside and you don't involve anybody, place, or thing. Pretty soon you put the pin back in it instead of it being coming an explosion. But it has to start somewhere. Progress, right? Okay. We become much more efficient we do not tire so easily, for we are not burning up energy foolishly as we did when we were trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. It works. It really does. Now, here's your highlight this again. We, alcoholics, are undisciplined. So what does that mean? Let's start there. We alcoholics are undisciplined. What are they talking about that? We alcoholics are undisciplined. How? They just talked about it mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. We're undisciplined. We used to be governed and driven by our thinking and our emotions. Anybody? We're, we're all trigger-oriented. I'm so affected by everybody. Well, you're a walking sense of, you know, you're a walking sore. 
You know, the guy goes to the doctor, doctor, it hurts when I, when I push here, and it hurts when I push here, and it hurts when I push here. The doctor says, yeah, you have a broken finger. So, so, so what happens <laughs> is, is that's how we go through life. If you're looking, if you're offended all the time, we look for opportunities to be offended, yeah. right? If you, like, we look for opportunities to express my, I remember my sponsor, go, I go to my sponsor and says, these people make me so crazy. He says, no, these people make you aware of how crazy you are. <laughs> oh, we're undisciplined, right? So? So we let God discipline us in the simple way we have just outlined. Just outline and have been outlining is the same meaning that we just outline. What did they just outline? Step 11. If they said have been outlining, then they would have said everything. Right. Right. They're saying, no, this whole thing is about my relationship with source and being connected with it. Here they would have said, here we practice 10, 11 and 12 every day. No, we practice our connection with source many times each day, stopping, pausing. Where's my relationship? Where am I with connection with source? Where am I in harmony? Am I instinct based or am I connected to the source? Where's my power? Where's my energy? Where am I? Am I where my feet are or am I disassociated with myself? Am I present? Am I able to be here? It's like going to a meeting. Anybody remember when you go to a meeting, you sit down and you're bombarded with all your thinking and things that are unresolved and the mind blah, 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 and it takes some of us like half an hour. When I was new, sometimes I take the whole meeting. I couldn't tell you who read how it works. Anybody? So what happens is that self letting you know of all this energy that you're attached to. Here they're saying, when you go to a meeting, stop. Pray. God, allow me to be here. And sometimes what that is, is we have to repeat everything everybody's saying just to stay present. We learn how to meditate is to concentrate to be present. Anybody ever read here? You know when you read and think? That's a form of meditation, but it's interrupted meditation. So what that says is a lot of people try to meditate and not have any thoughts. That's not really meditation. Meditation, there's, there's no void, right? So when you read and you, and you start thinking, stop and go back and start reading again. And sooner or later, you'll be able to discipline your mind to be where you are in your reading. When you're in a meeting and you're prone to wandering, you stop, pray, and you start repeating the person who's reading how it works or their story or some, or some form of prayer that keeps you present. So sooner or later, then you start finding yourself being more present than ever. So if I was to be disciplined in the way we just outlined, from morning all through the day and night, what would my life start looking like? If I was more concentrated on my relationship with a power greater than myself instead of my relationship with me and my instincts, my fears, my resentments, and my conduct with other people and seeing what I could get out of life and seeing how I could be of service by fitting myself to be of maximum service to God and the people around me, if I became more concentrated on the guy who was dying of alcoholism in the meeting than I was my new car, my new this, my new that. So when I went to a meeting, I realized it's an hour of carrying this message, not an hour of carrying the mess. It's not an hour. No, nobody cares in the meeting of me talking about me for an hour and how great my life is. What got me my life? What got me the life that I'm living? What has me connected? Experience, strength, and hope. What we used to be like, what happened, and what we're like now. If you want what we have. Well, what allowed us to get this? This is what got us this. So what they talk about, I'll be one second here, Kim. So they talk about here, if I don't do these indications then that tells me I'm off, I'm getting off base. If I don't do a night, morning, and through the day, that starts telling me the indicators on my, on my dashboard are starting to show up. This is the only indicator I have to see if I'm staying on track or not through this discipline. Because if I veer off the path and I'm not using the GPS, I have nothing to go by but how I feel, think, and start being deluded by self again. But if I'm doing this, I can't help but stay connected. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Right on. Thanks, guys. I really enjoyed this. Oh, last exercise. Sorry. Is if, How many people is looking for second stage recovery? First stage recovery is all about you. 
Second stage recovery is all about a relationship with something greater than you. And if you're looking for something to, to rocket you right into the fourth dimension, within three weeks you can have a whole new experience with you and the people in the world around you. So you take a piece of paper like this, fold it in half, right? And then on one side of the paper, you see here, so when you unfold it, so on one side of the paper here, write down how they do step 11, you read through it and, and hit all the highlights how they do step 11. Then when you got all those highlights for one week, you'll, so tonight's Thursday, Friday, put the abbreviation of Thursday, Friday side up there. And then when you retire at night, you ask if you did these things, yes or no. These instructions, these disciplines, these spiritual disciplines, you'll write down yes or no that I do them for a week. Then, after a week, you'll take this piece of paper, put it aside, get a brand new piece of paper, read through step 11, how they do step 11, again, and you'll do that for another week. After that, you'll take that piece of paper, you'll put it aside. And after three weeks, you'll look at the pieces of paper, and you'll see a remarkable difference of this becoming a working part of the mind, and your life will be rocketing into, it'll be just like, like driving your car, right? It'll just be a natural way of doing things. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Um, just a quick announcement before we go. We will touch on the seventh tradition, which states that Alcoholics Anonymous is self-supporting through our own contributions. These contributions help cover the group's expenses, which for this group helps in, or also includes our um, rent for the hall we actually visit when we have in-person meetings. Uh, we do have obligations to pay our rent to the Alano Club, even while we're not present there. Um, so... Uh, 164 and beyond is paying the rent at the Alano for this meeting, which normally is meeting at the Alano. Um, and we're working on contingency plans so we can keep involving all of you all over the place in our big book workshop. Um, so we've got the PayPal in the chat. Um, please donate if you can. If you aren't able to donate to our um, PayPal, we encourage you to look at your local intergroup or to GSO directly. Uh, we were saying on Tuesday, uh, GSO just took its second large donation from their uh, prudent reserve. So instead of having 12 months of, um, of um, costs, uh, they're down to seven. So um, the prudent reserve is down substantially. And when we say they take a, a sizable chunk, it's a seven figure sizable chunk. Um, so if you are able to donate to GSO directly, we encourage you to do that um, as well as include, um, uh, encourage your local group to make um, their seventh split. Even though you're not meeting, you can have a business meeting over the phone um, via email or via Zoom and do a split and donate to your levels of service locally. Uh, so that was in the thing. We're going to close with, what are we closing with today? Oh, third step prayer. And if we you find this helpful, what we're doing here, please uh, let us know. Um, uh, let us know on the Big Book page or let us know through the chat. Hopefully it's helpful. Hopefully it's a lot of new stuff, very interesting. And, and it becomes magical. It becomes uh, uh, this beautiful gift of Alcoholics Anonymous. Joe, you want to add anything before we close her up? Yeah, just uh, if anybody wants to touch on these talks, YouTube, Tony R. Vancouver, and all the talks and the sheets are available on that channel. Joe does a great job putting this all together. He does a lot of stuff, the scenes in the background. He has a big book study that he puts on Sunday. You can get that information also on the big book page or ask one of the guys in the chat when that is. He does an awesome job for a guy in his mental condition. And Kimberly, you're always a bright shining star. It's always good to be in your light. And uh, I pray that whatever you came here with, that you're able to keep. And if you're looking for something, I pray you keep it. Or find it, and for those who will, what makes this all possible, we'll close with the third step prayer. God, God I offer myself, myself to Thee to build, to build with, with me and to do with, to me, do with me as, as Thou wilt. Will. Relieve me of the bondage, of, bondage of self, that, that I may better, better do Thy will. will. Take, Take away my, my difficulties, difficulties that victory over them may bear witness, witness to those I would, I would help of Thy power, Thy love, and Thy way of life. life. May, May I do thy way. I will always. Live long and prosperous. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, and guys. if you're interested, we do have our regular evening meeting starting in 26 minutes. Hang around. Grab another cup of coffee. 
go use the facilities, and we'll see y'all in 25 minutes. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Kimberly. Thank you, everybody, for having us Thanks, in your homes. Everybody. And I'll be wearing spandex tonight on the main meeting, just so you know. <laughs> this is where we pro pause and pray. <laughs> right Thanks, guys. Good night. Gotta go eat.